and uh, and I'm okay with this part being recorded. You know, I I, I think that it it needs to be shared, and it needs to be told. Um, this is the way that I've been taught. Um, how we do do things when you want to start in a good way is with the smudge. And so, you know, I offer this smudge to all of you, even if you're not here in this room with me. Um, if matakyo asin, that means that that what I'm saying right now, even though in you're in your space, uh, I'm going to be affecting you hopefully for the good. So I want to smudge so that that helps me in, in sharing what I need to share so that it helps you to, to learn or to hear what you need to hear today. Um, and so this smudge, we, we go picking at, um, you know, Kanukama Beach, we offer that tobacco down, we never take more than we need. Um, and uh, we also have picked at Zakame and, um, and so that's my husband's reserve or First Nation. So, um, yeah, so I'm just, oh, my grandbaby's at the door, but her, my daughter's there. She, they're okay. <laughs> she wants to see grandma. <laughs> so um, I'm going to smudge my eyes to help me to see good things. I'm going to smudge my mouth to help me to say good things. I'm going to smudge my ears and I smudge them twice because I need to hear but also to understand I have a tough time with that so I smudge my ears quite a bit I smudge my mind to be able to share my knowledge but I smudge my my mind to protect my knowledge I smudge my heart to protect my heart and I smudge it again to share my heart but not too much just what needs to be shared right and then I just smudge my body my my essence my spirit you know, just great gratitude for this body, gratitude for, for what I, what I um, have, what was, I've been given, because it carries me every day. So it's been a, it's been a tough um, week here. It started off really good with a woman's ceremony. We had um, 13 women lift their pipes to pray for our communities, and, and that was a real um, energizer you know, lifting our spirits. And I, I think that it, without our ceremonies, it would be a lot more difficult to, to whether, you know, hearing the news about um, the, the children that they found at Merivale. Um, you know, those are my, my close relatives over there. And, and we have family who, who've gone to that school. My husband went to that school um, when, it was, when it became um, a, a day school. So, you know, it's been a tough, um, really difficult uh, time, not just for me, but for, for our, 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 our elders and, our, and our, our families who I think we're all connected um, to somebody, of course, there and at the other school. So, you know, it's, it's a reopening of, of some of the wounds, but it's also an opportunity to see, you know, can, how can we help to heal these wounds? And so, for me, it's been ceremony. I don't think that, I think that it would have been very, very difficult, you know, to be able to come today and talk if I didn't have, you know, that ceremony. So we smudge, that's a ceremony. You know, we, we have our, our, our trinupa, our pipe ceremonies. Those are helpful, you know, and then we're starting to go into our, our sun dance a time. And yesterday was a full moon. We have a full moon ceremonies. And so, you know, a lot of times these aren't advertised, but they're happening. And, and we want more, more community members to, to go and to just to, to be able to find some, some sol solace, some solace, some, some way to, to I, don't, I can't say get rid of the grief, you know, but some way to, to find a way through. And, um, you know, I'm before I start my presentation, I, you know, I just thought of this, this, um, this story that I've heard many times about the buffalo and how, you know, when a storm is approaching, when a storm, whether it's a blizzard, whether it's a, um, a, a um, thunderstorm, you know, the buffalo, instead of turning away from the storm and, and running away from it, they'll go towards the storm because the sooner you go toward putting their head down and, and finding their way through that storm, you know, the sooner you get out on the other side. And so that's, 
that's been a teaching that I've heard many times within our communities. And, and so, but, you know, it's kind of like, well, how do you deal with this? What, right. And so, you know, I think a lot of our, I know I've heard the story. We've, we've all heard the story orally from our elders and our, the residential school survivors that the children were there. And, and now everybody knows, right? And so it's a collective grief that we're in and collective trauma. And so, you know, how, what, what, how I've been managing or how I've been addressing it, or I'm not even sure the proper, proper words, forgive me if I'm, if I'm not using those proper words, but how I've been, you know, um, addressing the grief and, and, and depression and uh, the trauma, you know, um, and even not knowing why I was depressed, you know, understanding now that there's this residual trauma that's been, that's been passed down through us intergenerationally that, that I'm hoping that we find ways to, to address that, right? And it's, and it's good that everybody else knows now that the world knows because you know, now maybe there's some empathy, right? There's maybe some empathy for our communities and, and our, my, my relatives, my family, you know, who, who are having really, really difficult times dealing with the trauma. So I'm, I'm going to, um, you know, I don't see everybody. I only have a limited amount of, of, of names on my screen. So I see there's over a hundred participants. I'm really grateful for the people that have come to listen. I'm going to do my best to, to speak for, for um, uh, I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> probably 40 minutes to an hour. Um, depends on the stories that are going to come out. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and, and start my presentation. And um, and uh, I'm going to make sure I find my water bottle here somewhere <laughs> so I don't get uh, too dry. But yeah, so let's, let's start my presentation and I'll give an introduction of who I am. All right, so um, my presentation is called Bringing Back the Buffalo. And uh, my name is Jolie Big Eagle Kikwedewe. I'm a Nakoda, Cree, and Soto, or Anishinaabek. I'm from the White Bear First Nations. Um, and White Bear is about two hours southeast of Regina. Um, it's on Treaty 2 land, but we didn't sign Treaty 2. We didn't sign Treaty 4 in uh, September 15th, 1874. We actually signed the what's called the addendum to the treaty the following year. So we resisted signing treaty as long as we could. And um, in my, um, my, home, my home territory, White Bear, um, we were forced to amalgamate with um, uh, Ocean Man and uh, Pheasant Trump in the early 1900s. And, uh, and then we, so our rel my relatives are also from Ocean Man and Pheasant Trump. We, we has settled with the land claims in the 80s and now those other two split off and but those are still my relatives so uh, i'm mother to five children um, between the ages of 10 and 31. i i live in regina um, i've made my home base as regina and I, and i i um i live in a, a neighborhood that's called north central i'm i'm, I'm doing my best to rethink it as buffalo meadows so uh i've I'm a co-founder, I'm an artist, um, co-founder of Buffalo People Arts Institute. And I like to call myself an interdisciplinary Buffalo artist. Everything I do is around Buffalo. I'm, I'm sharing stories about Buffalo. Um, I bead Buffalo. I, I paint Buffalo. Here's a, here's a Buffalo picture I painted. <laughs> I, um, I, you know, my life, my, my mantra is Buffalo. And so I'm going to tell it, share my story today. And, and hopefully um, some people, uh, hopefully you're, you're, you gain some insight as to why I'm so obsessed with Buffalo. Um, you know, but a big part of it is, um, you know, uh, just a short story. I, you know, I grew up knowing I was an Indian, but I never knew that I was Nakoda Cree Soto. And it's really heartwarming to hear some of the youth today who are saying, you know what, I'm Cree, right? They're, they're not just saying, I'm an Indian. 
right? But back growing up, um, when I was uh, younger, I knew I was Indian, but I never knew I was Nakota Cree Soto. And I, I didn't know my mother went to residential school. Nobody talked about residential school, right? It's only really been in the last, um, since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that more and more people are talking about it. So, you know, I, I've been searching for, for my identity. I've been searching for that connection. And, and my mother was the one who began that reconnecting in, um, when I was in my 20s, when she started to lead us back into ceremony, into sun dances, sweat lodges, and, um, and connecting us with storytellers. That, that's my, my biggest wish is to, to connect with elders and to just to sit and listen. I, I am, you know, I know I've been welcomed into the group, the grandmother's group, and, and so I'm grateful for them for, for initiating this, this discussion. And, um, you know, and I'm like, I just want to come to the meeting in person soon and, and just sit and listen. And I'll be the person who hands out tea to everybody. And just, uh, you know, I love listening to stories uh, from our elders. So, you know, I've, I've talked to many people, including elders, I've read books. And um, so my presentation is based on a number of these um, ways of knowing. All right, so. So let me know if you guys can't see anything. I know technology seems to work most times, but <laughs> if I'm talking about something and you don't see the, the slides flipping, let me know. So mm -hmm. I, I wanna talk about some of the mistruths first because these are some of the things that confused me growing up. And, and so, you know, I grew up with the, the hypothesis that the Bering Land Strait Theory, uh, that's how my ancestors came to this land. This is hypothesis, right? So a hypothesis is something that you, you present to somebody. And I think I'm talking to some of the academic community. So some of you know that a hypothesis is something that you present with your findings until somebody else disproves it. And so this theory says that we came, there was a land bridge between Asia and North America. And my ancestors, you know, came across that land bridge chasing wild game. Um, you know, and so that was, that's the theory that's presented in, in history books. And I believe it's still presented in some of our history books and it's still shared by, by um, academics in, in various places. And so, you know, I, I'm gonna talk about, um, you know, some of the ways we're gonna disprove that and, and that that is, is a false, uh, a false theory. Um, we've been here for, for thousands and thousands of years. So I'm going to talk about this mistruth. The other one is that we were hunters and gatherers versus farmers. And so that's a hypothesis that we were, you know, that we were basically, um, you know, berry pickers or, or um, you know, just random, random vegetable pickers and that we chase the buffalo or the wild game. But there's, you know, I, I look to our, our relatives in the East, um, you know, the, the, um, the Haudenosaunee and the, the, um, the Iroquois um, people, the Anishinaabe people. And, and they, they talk about um, how they, they um, I, get, I, I don't call them farming, but how they grow corn beans and squash. And so corn beans and squash, you know, these are all traditional indigenous plants. These are um, plants that, that they grew. And actually, um, I know a story here where we, we also grew, um, you know, these, these plants here in Saskatchewan. And so the thought behind corn beans and squash is they call them the three sisters. And so, you know, you plant them together. You don't plant like a mono agricultural way, but you plant them together because they each provide a benefit to each other when they're planted, right? There's nutrients in the roots that help the other plants to grow. There's some shade that's given to the other plant that helps that plant to grow. And so this, this wasn't random. This is something that was carefully considered in, in how we plant. And so, that's how we would supplement our, our, you know, wild game. And we also traded, right? Like you can, um, you can dry corn and, and you can trade that as well. So, 
And there's oh, thousands, I, I say thousands, hundreds of different kinds of corn as well, not just the corn we see in our store today. And so there's groups out there that are, that are, um, I guess, what do they call them? Heirloom seeds. They're, they're keeping those heirloom seeds and, um, and protecting them and, and using them in, in various First Nations communities. So, you know, I also want to talk about Indigenous territories and systems of governance. I think that, so I'm working on another project called Rematriate. I'm working, I'm talking about how our, you know, there's, and other people, of course, have talked about this, how our system of governance and, and the way that we, we exercise that was our matriarchs, our grandmothers, our kukums, our kushis, they were the boss, right? They were the ones who, who guided the community, but in a different way, not in the way we, we think right now, right? So the kushis were the ones who, you know, were the, the medicine people. They, you know, the ones who looked after the children, birthed the children, but they were the ones where who the men would come to for guidance and say, this is what's happening. We, we need your guidance. And so, you know, it was the mothers who would be the kushis who would say, you know, based on my experience, based on my knowledge, this is what I recommend. And the men would listen, you know, the men would listen and they would go and do what they needed to do based on that knowledge, based on that, that, um, their, that guidance, right? And, and so, you know, it's, there's the residual, um, uh, I guess, residual, um, of there's a residual system still happening, right? And so it's joked about, right? It's joked about that how, you know, you have to fear the kushis or fear the grandmothers because, yeah, if you talk back to them, you know, you're going to get like a backhand or something. And that isn't true, right? And most of the, the kushis and the kukums I know, you know, now I understand about residential school and I understand some of those teachings that were that were maybe um, what do you call squashed, right? By the by the residential school and the nuns and the priests. But you know, some of some of those teachings have come through regardless of, of that. You know, and so it's there's compassion, right? And there's always endearment. And and now as we recognize, you know, what residential school has done to our communities, a lot of kushis and grandmothers are finding ways to bring those old ways of, of governance back, right? Through, through love and endearment and, and through, you know, um, through, through um, just letting their grandchildren know they love them, right? And raising the grandchildren. A lot of our cookums are raising their grandchildren. And so it's coming back. The, the men are, are you know, um, the good leaders are, are seeking the, the guidance of the grandmothers. And, and so, you know, I look forward to that day when when uh, we rematriate, we bring back the matri matriarchs of our community, right? And so, how that's going to look, it's going to be a little bit different than it used to be, but it's gonna it's coming back. And so, in terms of indigenous territories, you know, I, I know that people have heard, oh, there were wars in the back and before, and that you know the Cree people were fighting the Blackfoot people, and we we had ter defined territories. And if you look at different maps, you could see defined territories of the Cree, the Cinnaboyne, the Blackfoot, the Anishinaabe people, you know, the Inuit people, the Dene, right? Um, but um, you know, I. Um, Jeez, my, this is going to be a longer story than I thought. <laughs> I'm just going to share a story about uh, something that that I know. So the Diné people, um, they're from typically from northern Saskatchewan, kind of into Northwest Territories, maybe a bit of northern Alberta, northern Manitoba. So the Diné people are up there, and and something that that I've um, that that you know. In my lifetime, um, I've, I've been to the Navajo Nation. Um, the Navajo Nation is, is down in, um, uh, you know, Arizona, um, uh, New Mexico. You know, um, I think uh, there's a place called the Four Corners. I think it's Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. I'm missing one of the the, the states. But the Navajo people are a strong people. They have um, they have they're a huge nation. And uh, they have their own system of government, and they have their own laws. They have their own police. They have their own judicial system. And um, I've I've met people from that area. I have met uh, a, a woman who wanted to be an astronaut, 
And I always wonder if she became an astronaut. You know, so, so they're a big nation and they have their language. They have their language, Navajo. But they call them, when, when you talk to them and you, you talk more about who they are, they talk about being, um, uh, I don't know if it's Dene Navajo or Navajo Dene. And so their language is similar to the Dene of the Northern, these Northern Dene. And so they're related. And a long time ago, there was a separation of the people. Some people went North, some people went South, right? And they're really in drastic different territories. And so, you know, I was reminded of that because, you know, it isn't, we don't really have defined territories the way it is neatly defined in, in maps of today. Right, so our territories and our extended family extend like all over. I went to New York a few years ago and I was greeted by uh, a cookum from the Bronx who is um, half, half Native American, half black. And she, she hugged me and she said, you know, welcome home. And, uh, and I was like, I'm, I'm not from New York. What do you mean welcome home? You know, but we're just connected to each other, even if we're thousands of kilometers away from each other. We recognize that kinship, that Wakodawin, um, that um, Matakiwasan, right? We're all related. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to talk about that because there's totally this mistruth is still being um, shared out there in our communities. And I believe, you know, that there's a bigger way to look at them. So, and uh, so I'm going to talk about manifest destiny. And um, I just recently put this in my presentation. I've been giving this presentation for a few years now, and I keep adding to it as I, as I gain more knowledge. And um, I put this in because last year there was a song on the radio, um, and it was called High Hopes by um, Panic at the Disco. I don't know if anybody's um, heard of heard of the group. It's a it's a it's for the younger people. I don't know if there's any younger people on the call, um, but I, I liked it. Right, I was singing along to it. But in the song, it talks about um, how uh, you know this young fellow has you know dreams and he's going to fulfill his manifest destiny. And I was like, oh, I got to stop singing along to this. Does this does this singer know what manifest destiny means? Do I know what manifest destiny means? And I was like, I gotta, I gotta revisit this. And um, so I did a little bit of, of online research and, and reading of, of some things. And, and so manif and so this one always goes over my head because I've heard some of our elders talk about it, like um, Saul Sanderson. He's one of our treaty, treaty elders or, or knowledgeable treaty people. And so he talks about manifest destiny, but every time he talks about it, it's just like, whoa, just too big. I just it's so old, right? It's from 1493. It's a papal bull from the Pope Alexander the Sixth, and it's he issued this decree, right? And I'm like, okay, that's old. Like, let's get over it, right? That's like, it's not how relevant is it? Well, unfortunately, it's still relevant. So this 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 doctrine of discovery said that if there are any any new lands that are available and they're not not inhabited by Christians or Catholics, then that land is is ripe and uh, available to be colonized, and that the people on its land are not to be considered people, but to be considered subjects or slaves. And so this was what was used to colonize North America using this decree. And uh, and so this image is an image you know that was created painted by an artist and that says, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so you could see in this image, there's this darkness on the half of the image and those are the Buffalo and the indigenous people. They're looking back, right? And, and then there's a center image of this God-like woman who is white, white, white flowing, pale skin. She's supposed to represent progress, but when I see this picture, all this reminds me of death and destruction. To, to me, there's always two sides to an image, you know? And so you look at on the other side, there's the trains, there's the wagons, the oxen, the, the settlers, the, the, you know, it's a little bit sunny. You can see way in the background, there's some ships there, there's agriculture, right? And, and so, you know, this was, this was the beginning of, 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 um, 
the attempt of um, of the end of of my ancestors by chasing us. Where are they chasing us? Right, they're chasing us to to either a death or to reservations. I, you know, I'm not sure where they're chasing us. I'll I'll talk a little bit about it later. And so, unfortunately, this manifest destiny is still being used, not just in songs, but it's being used in court cases to defend land and defend land that was stolen, defend land that was taken away from Indigenous people. And so the, this papal bull has never been rescinded. It's still in existence in the books of the, of, um, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I know that there's been a tireless effort by our politicians, by people, you know, um, that have gone to the Pope, that have asked for the apologies, that have asked for the rescinding of this papal bull. For, for years, for I'm talking decades here, um, you know, but it still exists. But it's something that you need to think about in the back of your mind of, of why we're in the condition that we are in right now. So I'm gonna talk about the indigenous history on this land. So when I was younger, um, geez, it's been, I graduated from grade 12 in 1987. So it's been a few years. So my, my biggest question I would ask when I was younger was why? <laughs> it was always like, why, why, why? I, I don't get it, why, right? Like uh, burying land straight theory, we came across on an on a ice bridge. Show me the bones. <laughs> Where are the animals that we were chasing? There should be tons of bones once we got over that bridge, right? On, on North American soil or on the, the Eastern, I mean, the. Asia side, where are the bones, right? Because we must have been tired running over this bridge. Where are the bones, right? I, they have, I don't think they found the bones. Anyways, um, so there's Vine Delorier Jr. He's a renowned scientist and lawyer and he was, his, his books he wrote, you know, God is Red, um, Red Earth, White Lies, um, uh, Custard Died for Your Sins, very, very controversial author and um you know those titles are are uh, definitely some some uh, eye grabbers right and so he has said we've always been here and in fact if we if you find um uh, traces of us in other parts of the world it's because we traveled out right so we traveled from from our land outwards right and so and so he, you know, that the amount of Indigenous people here pre-contact has been a contentious number. So it's been 1 million to 100 million Indigenous people that have been on this continent. And, um, you know, and of course, we, we never took um, census. And, uh, and then the other question is, well, where are the bones of the people? Well, um, maybe I'll talk a little bit about that as well um, in, in my, my next slides. But you know, for, for sure, our, our ancestors believed in no trace camping. We, we didn't build skyscrapers. We didn't build many permanent structures here to say, hey, we're here, you know, look at us. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna be here forever, right? So I'm gonna make my mark on this land. We did in different ways, but most of the ways that we, we left a legacy was our environmental footprint were through stones. And, and we call them Tonka Sheila, grandfathers, grandfather rocks, right? Um, I'm trying to pra practice my, my language too. I'm so, I'm switched between Cree and Nakoda. Um, Inia, Inia, that's, that's um, stone. So I look at places like Grasslands National Park. Um, they did a summer student project one year. And uh, I don't know which year, but the summer students went uh, within the park and they counted the teepee rings that were there. And they found 16,000 teepee rings. And uh, I try, I've tried to look for this literature, but this was told to me by one of the parks, the parks people um, when I went down there for a, an art um, camp, uh, a week long art camp and we did a walk around. So, you know, they, I, I, I hope to find the map or I hope to receive the map for these these TP rings, um, that would be great so that I can share that as well. But um, you know, so the Grasslands National Park, if if some of you aren't aren't from this area, it's actually about three hours south 
southwest or almost directly south of, of Regina. So um, just north of the border. And, um, and so the Grasslands National Park is home to, I think, between anywhere between 700 and 800 buffalo, free roaming buffalo. I don't know um, the acreage that they get to, to roam on, but I was there because of the buffalo. And, and so, you know, this, these are um, the footprint that we've left behind, the teepee rings, because we would set up our teepee, we'd put them, put the rocks around the teepee, uh, the buffalo hide, teep, um, buffalo hide canvas, then we would leave, so we'd leave our rocks because we knew we were coming around to that space again at a, at a later date. So, um, you know, we, we traveled in cycles, we traveled in circles, right? The other um, thing that I, I like to talk about when we talk about the history on this land is, you know, there were some footprints that were found um, and they were, um, you know, uh, preserved footprints and they radiocarbon dated them and they were like 13,000 years old. And this is from Calvert Island in BC. So, and, and a new discovery just this past uh, um, spring, I, I met with a fellow from, from um, Victoria uh, near Victoria on the Vancouver Island. And he had said there were three spots where they found, um, it was like a buffalo bone graveyard and, um, and the archeologists and scientists were, were, had sectioned these off and that they were, they were um, looking at the bones and, and, and doing the archeological research on them. So three sites on Vancouver Island, I had never heard there were buffalo there. And so my hope um, was to travel there this year and go visit the sites. But they also say that the buffalo found there aren't the buffalo from now. They're the ancestors of the buffalo. They're like bison, bison, bison. I, I'm not sure the scientific name, but you know, um, the other the other footprints that my ancestors have left are, you know, earth mounds, um, medicine wheels, and um, even the um, the the rock um, paintings in Waterton in in northern northern Saskatchewan right so everything is has been connected to to stones Inia uh, Tonkashila and um, and so you know those are what what I what I go to or I'm drawn to now to to try to draw energy from those places to help me to be, continue on with with my research. So part of the, the, the history of this land, I, I visit this city um, or this place called Cahokia Mounds and they call it the first city in Turtle Island. It's located in St. Louis, Missouri. And, um, and so we go to this, this amazing museum. I, I just love this museum. There is a fellow who, who just believed, a non-indigenous fellow who, who just fell in love with the people that, that were here and fell in love with the site. And, 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 um, and so he advocated to, to build a, a museum near this Cahokia mound. So this, Im this is an image of that mound and that mound still exists. Uh, doesn't ha it doesn't look like this now, but this is an artist's rendering of how it would have looked. And uh, saying that there are over 20,000 people or 2,200 acres. And, and so, you know, this museum is probably one of the best museums I've seen in, in North America that represent um, my indigenous ancestors in, in the, the most like really admirable way that I feel, felt really proud when I, when I went to this museum. And I went to the, I've, and no disrespect to any of the other museums like uh, the Smithsonian in New York, Smithsonian in, in uh, Washington DC, um, you know, I love the display here at the Royal Sass Museum. I know it's, you know, we have this, this great exhibit um, there, um, you know, and, and the Glenbow and I, everywhere, every city I go to, I go to the museums, even I went to the Louvre in Paris uh, a few years ago, and I tried, to, I went to the, the North American exhibit and I was scouting out how do people represent my ancestors? How do museum curators represent my ancestors? I come to the museums with a critical eye. <laughs> and so, you know, I just want to promote this site because, uh, you know, walking to that museum, I, I seen this man mannequin and he was slim and he had tattoos on his, on his, on his arm and he had jewelry and his hair was, 
was tied back with a braid and, and he looked dignified. He was standing straight, right? And he had really beautiful clothes on. And, and, um, and then the, the other mannequin that he was um, uh, talking to was uh, a jewelry maker. So he's sitting on the ground and him too, he had tattoos, jewelry. He looked really well and they're well proportioned. And, and I was like, wow, this is somebody that, that I can, I, I acknowledge as, as like, really well off and and that you know they they were they were representations of real people that might have ex existed right over uh, a thousand years ago and that's what we need more in the museums you know the like we had combs right so our, our museum they we need a grandmother's probably braided their hair right and so you know, a lot of the pictures that we see now are, are from times of, of, you know, the early, late 1800s. There was so much happening in the late 1800s. 1800s our people were going through so much that, that you know, they, they really were, um, they really had some pictures of, of people, my ancestors, who didn't look like they were doing well. And there's reasons for that. So, you know, I, I like this story because it just shows that, you know, there were all these mounds all across this, that land. And even in northern, um, uh, north, northern U.S., I've seen mounds and we have mounds here in Saskatchewan. There's, we built earth mounds for, for places of reverence, for, for burial sites, um, you know, for, we built effigies. Um, for um, to to honor our, our animal spirits, honor those connection to those those buffalo, right? We were so dependent on them, so we would make effigies of them out of earth, out of stone, and um, and this knowledge, this this I didn't never even knew about this city until uh, 2017, and and so I I I I promote this because I'm like this is a this is a, an earth mound that is uh, uh, a remnant of, of a people that lived in this area. And it's not that far, 17 hours drive. So these are probably some of my ancestors' uh, extended family. So I don't know where I'm at. I can't see my time. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm gonna share this, this, uh, this another story. And so I, I just found this, I do research, you know, all the time and, um, and I found this one story about this copper skull. They call it the copper skull and they dated it to be over 10,000 years old and they found it in Oklahoma. And what this is, is it's a buffalo skull. And why it's, it's such a, a, an amazing find for the archeologists and scientists is that, that, um, that this was painted. It's got the zigzag shape, right? So it's, it's painted and um, and so that zigzag shape, I, I recognize it, right? I, I recognize it as, um, as uh, the, you know, that, that lightning, it's a lightning mark, right? And, um, and that lightning is very powerful. Um, it, for me, looking at this, it probably would have been used in a ceremony, right? So this was found in the ground. It was dug out by the archeologists. They, they, you know, called their, their archaeologist peers and said, come look at what we found, this buffalo skull. And so everybody came and, and um, they were worried about it being washed away, right? And so they protected it. And then it took a long time, but a, a, mu a museum was being built um, around the time that the skull was found. Or I'm not sure if they built the museum because of this find, but the story goes is the museum was a brand new museum. They, they built a spot for this buffalo skull. And um, the night before the, the grand opening, there was a huge thunderstorm, huge rainstorm. And this brand new building, the, there was a leak. The only place that it leaked in that building was right above this buffalo skull, right? And I, I, I don't know if it was, it was um, encased by plastic or whatever, the story didn't, didn't, the newspaper article didn't, didn't share about that. But, you know, it, it was, well, that makes sense, right? Because this was meant to stay in the earth. This was meant to stay connected to the land. And that, that lightning mark, you know, there must have been a ceremony connected with it. And, and those ones that we don't, don't understand, we still don't understand that connection to our, 
you know, our, our earth, our, our skies, right? But they knew. And so they, they were sending a reminder, right? Hey, we, we see you, we, we feel you, we know you're there. That's my thought of, of why that, um, that rainstorm only affected the one spot above this buffalo skull, right? And so, you know, I, I just think that's a really powerful story and was told from, from the non-Indigenous viewpoint, right? So this, this is a, an article in a newspaper that, um, that was shared about this story. So they understood the importance of it and the relevance, but, but again, it, it's, you know, um, a lot of the, these things that we find, you know, they're, they're connected to the land and it, they're in the land for a reason. But it, it's, it's important to share these stories because they give, you know, a lot of people need proof, right? And so this is, is one of those proofs of the, our connection to the land and how long we've been here. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the truth. And so I do hashtag truth. <laughs> so, um, you know, since I've been doing this research for, you know, at least um, over 10 years, talking to people and, and reading. And so in the books that I've read, um, you know, you'll see, um, there's one fellow who has a nerve to say there are only 400,000 Buffalo in North America. You know, I, I'm just astounded at, at that level of, of, of uh, knowledge that, and he said, well, I, we, I, and I based this based on all the Buffalo that I found killed at the different massacres. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, you know, anyways, but um, so that number, and then you'll, you'll read in textbooks, it's tens of millions. Somebody, some people will say 30 million, 35 million. And then some of the braver ones say 60, 65 million. And then um, I have a friend in Alberta, you know, um, her name is Paulette Fox. She's with the Any Initiative, which Any in Blackfoot is Buffalo. And, and so, you know, we belong on this um, similar, this bison management committee with the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So we connected with other Buffalo minded people through that, that, um, that committee. And so she shared, you know, that there were 125 million Buffalo that roamed North America pre-contact. And I was like, what? I've never heard that number. That's a big number. And, and I, but I wouldn't, I didn't ever questioned it because she, she, she mm -hmm. talks to so many people. She's connected, you know, um, nationally mm -hmm. with so many individuals around North America that that's the number that's right to me and, and to her. And it makes more sense because, you know, you need, um, you need about 13 buffalo hides to make a, a um, I think a 16 foot teepee. You know, somebody's done the math. So about 13 buffalo hides. So, you know, if we look in this room, you know, there are how many people are here? 118. If, we, if you're all individual, have your, you're all individuals. And 118 times 13. I don't have my calculator, even though I have a mathematics degree. Um, that's a lot of buffalo that we would need just in this space, right? So we had to have sustainable hunting so that we could have buffalo, you know, for, for the, the next generations. And so, you know, so 125 million buffalo would produce how many calves in a year? It, it was sustainable. And, um, and so we lived with buffalo for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And, and how this really hit home for me, because I don't see, I've never seen this in any book I've read. I, I've never seen this number. Um, in, in any, um, you know, I have books that are 50 years old, you know, thank you to Evelyn at the Royal Sass Museum for loaning me book. I'll give it back to you soon if you're on this call. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have um, other books, you know, that are from, um, that were written in the 1800s from an Indigenous point of view, one called Buffalo Days and Nights. And anyways, you know, but why I, I read, one of the proof, here's one of the proofs. Right now, um, there are 90 million cattle in North America and the cattle aren't, um, what do they call that? Aren't uh, the an original animal of this land, right? They were brought over from, from the old world. Mm -hmm. And so in a span of, you know, when supposedly the 1492, 
and but America wasn't colonized till laughter. So let's just say in the span of just over 500 years, 90 million cattle have been able to to live on this land and we don't see 90 million cattle right I can't I don't see it because they're not here right but I know I've been to some I've driven past feedlots in Alberta you could see them all out there we don't see 90 million cattle so it's a big we have a big land base so 125 million cattle 125 million buffalo is more believable now knowing that you know that 90 million cattle exist on this land right now in a span of less than 500, 500 years. And so I got that from the, I think, North American Cattle Industry Association numbers or the U.S. Cattle Men Industry Association. Anyways, at the last page of this um, PowerPoint, I have on my list of sources. And so, you know, I also look at how every Indigenous nation in North America has a word for buffalo. And buffalo is actually an anglicized word that came from a French word, which a lot of our words do, um, buffalo, ox by the water. But, you know, tataga is, is a Nakota, Dakota, Lakota word for buffalo. Pate is the female buffalo in uh, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota. Pasqua mustus is, uh, is like a prairie, prairie buffalo um, in Cree. Mushkate bajiki. That's a, a Soto uh, Anishinaabe word for, for buffalo. Ini, that's a, a word from, from our, our friends over in, in Blackfoot territory. So, and I, everywhere, whenever I go somewhere, I, I, if, um, like I was a trade show in, in Las Vegas a couple of years ago, and I said, hey, you know, you guys are from Col I think Colorado, what's your word for buffalo? And they said it, it was almost like pate. It was like pate, almost like a p more enunciated pate, like a, yeah, like P-A-D, pate, I don't know. Yeah, anyways, so I, I'm still, I'm, I look for those other words too, just to show, highlight this truth. So let's see, and I can't see the chats. Um, so if you guys have questions, if you wanna put it in the chat, then, you know, then I, then we can look at it back um, when I'm, when I'm finished here. So, um, you know, the buffalo were our everything. Uh, I really want to emphasize that. So here's an image that I took off the Royal Sass Museum's website, the one on the left of the teepees and the cookums. Uh, she's sitting there on the buffalo robe, uh, talking to her, her grandchildren, her chapons, her tokoja. Um, and and the, that, that uh, teepee is actually made out of real buffalo hide. And so, you know, we, like I said, we needed 13 buffaloes to make a fair sized teepee. And, um, you know, and so we, we knew how to brain tan them. So we'd use the brains of the buffalo to, to tan the hide to make it waterproof, right? So that's how we were able to brain tan our buffalo robes because they were the warmest blanket we had. So you'll see in a lot of the older pictures, our chiefs are wrapped in, in these buffalo robes, usually with the fur side in. And uh, I mean, they were usually, they were, from my understanding, brain tanned so that they could be water repellent. So we would use them for the ground and they would, um, it would protect us from the cold. And you could see in the travois back there, it looks like a, um, a rawhide. We would, um, if we didn't use it for our teepees or sitting on the ground with our buffalo robes, we would use the buffalo hide as um, rawhide and uh, we would make um, our luggage out of them. Right for traveling with our, our anything that we needed to travel with. I really love this middle picture, and um, and so this is a picture of a kushi or cookum. She's she looks like she's um, got some some uh, dried buffalo meat, and she's pounding it to to um, from uh, the jerky state to pounding it so she can make buffalo pemmican. So that's what we would do to make our buffalo pemmican. We would dry the buffalo meat, pound it so it was flaky. Then we would dry like berries, like Saskatoon berries. And then we would uh, pound those two till they were flaky. And then we would get some buffalo fat, the rendering buffalo fat. And we mix it all together and make these energy bars called buffalo pemmican. And uh, when the newcomers came over, the hunters, trappers came over, we're like, you know, hey, do you want to know how to make buffalo pemmican? 
this is how you're going to survive our winters, right? Minus 40, minus 50. We can't hunt in that weather. So we would make buffalo pemmican and we'd store it, we'd clean out a buffalo stomach, we'd sew it up, it became our, our Ziploc bag. And we could store pemmican in there for, I, I read some in one article that it's up to two years you could store a buffalo pemmican. And I'm like, that's a long time. I don't know if it would last, but if you really need it to last two years, right? So, you know, when the newcomers came over, we taught them how to make buffalo pemmican. Um, actually, there was a pemmican war in Canada uh, in the 1800s between Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest, I think that's what it was called, Northwest Company. There are different two companies. They're both trading and hunt and trapping. And uh, somebody ordered buffalo pemmican. There was a shipment um, at this, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the details, but there was a shipment at this location and uh, it was designated for one of, the, one of the companies, but the other company swooped in and stole it. And it started this war, right? Because the people knew that they needed buffalo pemmican to survive, right? In order to go and hunt. Right, to go and survive the winters, right? They need that buffalo. So they started a war, Google it, Buffalo uh, Pemmican War in Canada. And, um, you know, so, so then it became really ironic when, when the buffalo started being killed off, right? But um, when you look at it, you know, the, the cattle were coming. So that was more a familiar animal than it was the buffalo. So, you know, the buffalo, uh, don't you don't need anything to do with buffalo they're pretty resilient on their own um, on the land and and able to look after themselves and even birth and calve themselves yeah so i see somebody um put it on the chat so <laughs> and this right this image on the bottom right you can kind of uh i don't know if you guys see if you want you can move your your video just click on the top right and it moves it to the bottom or the top right left to see the images this one on the right is actually an image from some photos called the um, on the Saskatchewan uh, History and Folklore Society page. And it's uh, pictures that were found and, and um, recovered from uh, Adrian Patton that were gifted to him by his relatives, uh, photographers. And so here's probably one of my relatives. This is taken in the White Bear area um, in the early 19, I think 19, 1907 to 1920 some sometime then so he's wearing a buffalo headpiece you know the we love the buffalo so much we respected them for everything that they gave to us we used every part of the buffalo uh, that we would honor them by by wearing their 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 hides their heads we would honor them by using their skulls in our ceremonies and we still to to this day we, we use those buffalo skulls and in sweat lodge and sun dance and rain dance and um, just honoring that memory. Although the buffalo aren't like the way they used to, we still honor them. They say there's about 500,000 buffalo right now in, in North America. And so, you know, that, that, that we're, we always say the buffalo are everything, right? And then people are like, well, education is a new buffalo, but some of our elders are saying, no, no, the buffalo is still our buffalo. We need to remember where we come from. We need to remember our identity. We need to know that we're, remember we're part of the Buffalo Nation, part of the Tatanka Oyate. That means Buffalo Nation, Buffalo people. So I'm gonna get, go, go back a little bit. So what happened to all the Buffalo? You know, that's the, the main point, point of this conversation is why do we need to bring back the buffalo? What happened to the buffalo? 125 million buffalo. Where's the buffalo museums? Where's the buffalo bone museums? Where's the, the sites? Where are all the bones? There's so many buffalo, where are the bones? Well, so here's a, when you do a little bit of research on, on buffalo, um, there is a fellow, a scientist, a researcher named Hornaday. He developed a map um, in about over 100 years ago on where the buffalo roamed. And so here's kind of two versions of that map. I like the one on the right. The one on the left, I think, is the uh, part of one of the original ones that he created. But on the one on the right is an adapted one. And so you look at the original buffalo, bison, buffalo, same thing. You look at the original buffalo range and it's all green. And it goes to 
what is that, Connecticut, almost to Georgia, then across, you know, to Texas, um, Mexico, along the Rocky Mountains up north to Northwest Territories, kind of diagonal under the Great Lakes, right? So he proposed that was the original Buffalo Range. And then in a span of, from contact to um, 1870, the Buffalo Range is now that yellow shape and then to 1889, just a span of 20 years, now those red dots, that's where the buffalo were. And they're actually counted. There's like less than less than a thousand buffalo there. And, and so I think the numbers were like 2,000, right? I, I don't know if there's ever been an accurate count of, of the, you know, the genocide of, of how many buffalo were killed to the point of almost genocide. But those there are dates on this on this map and that's the date the last buffalo was seen in that territory. So you see some of the dates 1760, 1720, 1886, the buffalo are being killed off in a westward fashion, right? And so we're, you know, the, the land is being colonized eastward to west, south to north, right? And so you can see that in this map all right, and so here's another version of another map. This is a more updated one. So this was, this is from a book. Again, the book is listed in the reference section on the last page. And, and so this was um, a book that was issued um, in 2016. And this shows outline of the historical habitat range of plains and wood bison in North America. And you see little buffaloes there. I've taken this map because it shows that the, some of the buffalo were saved at Elk Island, which is just by Edmonton. And so it shows that where some of the buffalo went, were, were handed out or trying to bring back the buffalo to different areas, right? And so you'll see a little buffalo on the right hand it's a screen. I think that's um, Cuba. So Cuba has some of our, the buffalo from Elk Island. That's what the purpose of this map was. But it also shows the outline of where the more extensive version of where the buffalo roamed. So now it goes all the way to New York, you know, maybe that's Maine you know, to Florida, right across the coast into Mexico, along the Rocky Mountains, a little bit into Washington State, uh, Northern California, then coming out again, must be a way to get in there. And then North, all the way to Alaska, along the coast, coming down, you know, through Northwest Territories, and then through Saskatchewan, Manitoba, back in under the Great Lakes. So this was, this is the most accurate map of where the Buffalo roam. So some of the the misinformation out there is that the buffalo were plains, right? That they were just the plains. Well, when you look at North America, right? And you've driven, if you've ever driven the land, you know, all, almost all in North America is plains. So when we say plains, we're, we're talking about most of North America. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I know, I think I'm getting to my one hour. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was a, uh, a PhD student who came to the U of R a few years ago, and her research was was studying the the heights of of um, indigenous people who were buffalo eaters or bison eaters pre contact versus post contact and after the buffalo were killed off. And so she, in her research and how she got her data on heights of people, I, I'm not sure, but I went and listened and. And so she had said that the heights of indigenous people were, were astronomical compared to where we are now. So we were healthy, we were strong, we were tall. And, um, and then you could see in her graph that as after Buffalo were, were, were killed off, you know, our height evened out with the rest of, of um, the population. And so, you know, the, the meat, um, you know, that, that we, that we ate from buffalo, you know, it helped us to to be strong and resilient and 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 uh, to be you know tall. Like I'm five foot three, and most of my family, the women are five feet tall. So we're we're reintroducing buffalo into our diet, and and maybe we'll see some of that effect in a hundred years. But you know, just a side note that uh, you know that the buffalo were in all of North America. So so now now I'd like to share, you know what was happening, how did, how do 125 million buffalo killed off? So, you know, I just quickly took a snapshot of, of Wikipedia, you know, Indian Wars west of the Mississippi. And um, this is my hypothesis. 
right? So there are all these wars going on in the 1800s. And uh, why were all these wars going on? And, and nobody talks about these wars, right? I think everybody knows about the Battle of Little Bighorn, right, as, as one of the, the, um, the well-known wars. But there were all these wars. Our, our people weren't just lying down and say, go ahead, come and take over the land. Yeah, go ahead, just take our land. No, the, our ancestors are fighting, and we we're fighting over land. We we're fighting over um, colonization. Right, and, and unfortunately, many of our people uh, died because they weren't able to, to overcome. But um, many of our people um, did survive. I'm the proof, I survived, right? Because of my ancestors fighting and, and, and also compromising and forced to compromise too. So, you know, I just share this because they're, this is just west of the Mississippi, right? Not, not east of the Mississippi. Um, you know, and so so all these wars were happening 18 in the 1800s, right? And so so what led to the the genocide of the buffalo, right? And so you know, in in the um, along with the wars, right, and the fighting that was going on, you know, um, a, a big part of my presentation talks about the U.S. cavalry, but the but the um, the Canadian uh, government at the time was complicit. Right, so what they were seeing in the U.S., they, they were, you know, um, supporting in different ways, right? Um, but so, you know, with the let's just talk about the transcontinental railroads because it was an important um, part of of the demise of the buffalo. So there, there are five transcontinental railroads connecting the east to the west, and um, and so when these were being built, um, you know, they were they were um, there were train crashes, right? So before they were even connected east to west, they started to put trains on them to connect like, I think, um, you know, the East Coast cities like New York to Kansas, right? And so when they put these trains on the tracks, you know, there were train crashes and, and, and so what were they crashing into? Buffalo. And so the powers that be, the train owners, the railway owners, the, the governments, they said, well, what can we do about these Buffalo? Well, let's take our guns on the train. We'll shoot ahead of the train, and we'll kill the buffalo to clear the track. And so they're like, "Oh, that's a good idea." And so they, and then they're like, "Hey, this is a great idea. Let's encourage uh, passengers bring your guns. You can shoot buffalo because it's so boring traveling through this land. You can shoot buffalo out out the windows, and 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 we'll just and we'll leave them. It's sport hunting, right? Just come and shoot buffalo. There's so many of them. It's like a sea of brown." both sides, right? It could, you know, the, the buffalo would be passing in front and making the, some of the train stop for, for days. That's how many buffalo there were. And so the U.S. Cavalry, some of the generals, General Sherman uh, is one name that stands out. Um, you know, um, he, he saw this happening and he was like, you know what? We have all these Indian wars happening. They cost money. We have to feed them the soldiers, clothe them, pay them, house them. These wars are, are really expensive. We, there's another, gotta be another way. If we can get the citizens to, we give them shells. We, we say, we'll give you 25 cents for a buffalo tongue. If we can get people to do the killing for us, then, then we'll, we'll, that will, um, you know, we're, we're, they need to find a uh, strategic way to, to, to um, kill the spirit of in, the Indian people. And, and they, they figured, you know, if we kill, get rid of the food source, they're gonna be too weak to fight. So that was the thought, that was the, this is the beginning of the end of the Buffalo. So people didn't know, people, newcomers coming, they never knew that we relied on the Buffalo for everything. Some of them did, but I, I would guess to say that most of them didn't. They just thought, I'm, I need that 25 cents. Back then, 25 cents was a lot, right? So, you know, and, and killing. Well, I, I like killing. They would use it as sport for fun. So in, in that span, using guns and Gatling, Gatling machine guns, because the army as well contributed to the genocide of the buffalo. That's how that many buffalo kill, were killed off in a short time period. And, and clearing the land for settlement, for colonization, for the land, um, 
and, and then what also happened around then. So the buffalo are being killed off at an alarming rate. And so the other thing that happened was the treaties were being signed, right? The Canadian governments, well, the British Crown at the time, they were like, well, it's got to be another way. We're, we're, there's too many wars. Let's sign, let's sign treaty with the, the, the Indian people. Right, so if you look at the map of Canada, right, there's no treaty until you get to, um, I'm, I'm not sure where it starts, starts getting to be treaty, but it's not, there's no treaty in the east part of Canada, right, because they were, because of the, the wars that were happening, the Beothucks were killed off, or most of them were killed off in, in Newfoundland, right, massacres that occurred on this land, right, not just the residential school, but it started back here with the killing of the buffalo. So the treaties were signed, but they were signed under duress. And some of you that, that know some of that legalese, you know, it means that we signed them, we were forced to sign them, right? Under the buffalo were no longer um, in the millions and, um, and our food source was exterminated. So, so we, we were forced to sign treaty and um, I, I didn't do any research on diseases passed to the buffalo from the cattle because um, in most of my research focuses on the, the, um, the extermination of the buffalo from, from the different um, you know, government agencies. And, and that's well documented, right? So that's well documented. Actually, um, I just shared an article on Buffalo People Arts Institute uh, last week about a, a really well-researched article about the influence of the the army and the and the um, U.S. government on the demise of the buffalo. So you can, um, if you'd like, you can go onto our Facebook page and, and read that article. Um, so you know, I you know, going back to the treaty signing, um, you know, so so we look at Saskatchewan. All of Saskatchewan is treaty land, right? Treaty two, four, five, six, seven. Eight and ten. Now, there's not one white spot on our map because all of Saskatchewan is treaty land, right? So we signed treaty. My ancestors signed treaty, saying yes, we will sign it because we want to keep the peace. But we also recognize this is our territory. This is our this is our land, right? And so the government didn't see it like that way. The spirit and intent of the treaty and what was relayed, what didn't wasn't what was ended end up being written. You know, and so, you know, but our ancestors were smart enough to say, you know what, these treaties, when do they end? When does this contract end? We signed it, 1874, 1875, the addendum. When do they end? We end, you know, when the sun, as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow. And I really give credit to the McKenzie Art Gallery for putting that up on outside of their building. Um, they recognize that. Right, they recognize the artist who who wanted to put that up there. That you know, when you talk about we're all treaty people, well, we we fulfill our treaty duty every year. We have treaty days, right? And by the treaty, we get five bucks. I go and I collect my five bucks, and I can't just get it from an administrator. The administrator has to give it to the red surge who represents the government, represents the queen. I have to shake that red surge's hand to get my five dollars, my children's five dollars, right? And then you know my my band wiper, they get, I think they still get rifle shells and a flag and twine. I think they get money now instead of oxen and agricultural implements. You know, so we're still enacting treaty every year by taking that $5, even though it's symbolic and that $5 doesn't provide us with sustenance the way it used to. But I always ask, well, what are the other people keeping treaty doing? What are the, the non-Indigenous people doing to keep treaty? they're not keeping their end of the bargain in terms of keeping the peace, right? We look at residential school, you know, we look at the killing of Colton Bushi and we look at the, you know, what's the, the what's happening in our communities right now. There's no, there's no understanding of, of the other side of how to keep the, how to, to fulfill the duties of treaty from the other side, right? So, you know, and, and then, um, you know, this, so, so we were forced to sign treaty because we didn't have the buffalo anymore. And the treaty say, you know, we'll provide you with flour, sugar, salt, and we'll provide you with meat, but pork, pig, 
you know, and I always tell the kids I can eat bacon, you know, I like bacon, but eating it three times a day, seven days a week, I'll get sick. And so no wonder why there's diabetes is rampant in our communities because it got buffalo meat was replaced with pork, right? So, you know, it, it's it's really important to know this history, to understand, you know, and be empathetic with, with what's happened here in, in this land. This is Treaty 4. So there's a map here of my um, white bear and Fezram Ocean Man. This is how it looked originally when we signed treaty. And like I said, the, right after we signed treaty, Bezrump and Ocean Man are forced to live on white bear and, and they sold away all that land. And so because that was illegally done, we had land claims and that was settled in the eight, 1980s. And Bezrump and Ocean Man weren't able to rebuy buy back all of their land the way it looks. So they had to parcel it out. So if you if you like your research, you can go and you can find out from maps of Saskatchewan that Fezrump is all over, parcels of land everywhere. Ocean Man is the same thing. And why is that? Because they had to buy back their land. So back to where it happened to the buffalo. So I'm almost at the end of my presentation. So thank you for, for hanging in there and listening. I know I have a few more minutes here. I wanted to leave a little bit Q&A at the end. And so I, I've tried to find a picture of the pile of buffalo bones on the, the site known as Regina. I haven't been able to because Regina's nickname is pile of bones. And I even removed buffalo from that nickname, but it's pile of buffalo bones. And so, you know, after all the killing was done, shooting from the trains, the cavalry killing with the Gatlin guns and, um, and settlers, you know, unaware some aware, you know, the Buffalo Bill Cody's of the world, the wild, you know, wild Buffalo Bill, right? Just, just being known for killing an um, enormous amount of Buffalo, one single individual, right? There are many of those kinds of men who were admired at the time for their hunter prowess as killing Buffalo, right? So killing off of the Buffalo led to these piles of piles of Buffalo bones all over the land. Right, so this image to the left is an image taken from a book that I have, and um, and they, what they would do after the buffalo all killed off, and and uh, they would, people found an uh, entrepreneuristic, uh, entrepreneur, um, what's the word, uh, opportunity, and so they figured um, if they could pile them in in the shape of a railway car, figure out how much they were going to make per railway car. And so this is actually a picture taken in Gull Lake. The one on the left is a picture taken of Gull, in Gull Lake. And that's about an hour west of Regina. So where would they ship them to? So there's this popular image on the internet of on the right-hand side of this pile of buffalo bones. And if you look at the bottom, that's a picture of a man. Maybe he's six feet. And the man on the top is six feet. So you estimate this to be about 20 to 25 feet tall, going all the way as far as you can see. There's gotta be at least a million buffalo skulls just in this image alone. And so what they would do is they ship all the buffalo bones. And, and you know, in one article I read, at times, you know, there were human bones that were, were, were picked up and, and put in alongside some of the buffalo bones. I can't verify that um, at this point, um, but you know, it, it was referenced in uh, in one of the articles and books that I've read, you know. And so, you know, I um, there there's a few few websites out there. There's and there's definitely a lot of books out there. But this is definitely it's not something that's shared, um, you know, in in the public domain. But you know, all these buffalo bones were then taken to these factories. So this picture on the right is taken at a Detroit factory. And what they would do with the bones is they would pulverize them and they could um, turn, use them in, um, in fertilizer. And then they could also use them um, to, for bone china. And, and uh, they could also use them for um, in the process of uh, changing sugar from its natural state of yellow to changing it white. And so the ironic part is in fertilizer, you know, what you do with fertilizers, of course you spread it out on the land, hoping to regenerate the soil. So the buffalo bones have been scattered all over this land as uh, tiny fragments 
right? And so that's what happened to the buffalo. Those millions and millions and millions of buffalo, they were smashed into smithereens. So that's why we don't have buffalo bone museums. That's why we, we don't talk about what happened to the buffalo. It's a black mark on the um, Canadian history, right? Um, British history, uh, you know, the US history. And, uh, you know, and, and there's an article that I, I did an art exhibit on, and it was, um, uh, it was from, I think, the 1980s. And, and so they published this article, and it talks about Saskatchewan's bones. And it talks about, I think, that they estimated based on the weigh scales, based on um, how much bones were shipped out from just the Saskatoon area, that it amounted to um, 3 million buffaloes based on the weight based on how much uh, the weight of, of one buffalo set of buffalo bones would be, right? So, you know, these buffalo are being killed off all over this land and, and then, yeah, being, being shipped out to be, to be um, gotten rid of. So, you know, I, I think I'm gonna have to, to, I'm not sure what to my time is, um, but I think I have to, uh, yeah, Tom, wrap it up. <laughs> so I just want to talk about the buffalo's impact on our ecosystem. There's some people doing these massive amount of research. And so they looked at the period when the buffalo were wiped out and how it affected the global ecosystem. So there was a moment in time where the amount of methane or the amount of, of, of um, the impact of the buffalo was felt, right? So they could look at the, you know, what was happening in the earth atmosphere by the loss not necessarily methane, sorry, I shouldn't say that because I don't know if it was methane that they were studying, but they, they noticed that something happened in that, that 1800s, probably from the land. And, you know, but even now when we reintroduce buffalo back into our ecosystem, they're grazing, um, they can, Yellowstone is, is doing some research. So they're looking at how buffalo graze and how they'll, when they eat, they'll eat, eat the top of the grass and then they'll go to wherever they graze, because Yellowstone buffalo get to graze in the park, that's their land. So when they graze, they come back to that, that first area that they might have grazed in the springtime, they'll re-graze it in the fall and the grass has grown already. So they can graze twice in one area. Whereas, whereas cattle, they'll just eat the whole roots out and they'll eat everything. They can't, they can't go back and, and graze that area. That's what I've been told. I, I, I don't know the cattle's eating, eating um, uh, methods, but that's what I've been told. And their hooves, when their hooves are re were in, digging into the ground, there's been new ecosystems that have, have come back, right? That they, people have thought were extinct and they've come back and buffalo have been reintroduced to the land, right? So there's some, some scientific backing of, of how they help our ecosystems and they return to the land. So there's other groups out there um, that are, you know, big contributors to helping to bring back the Buffalo, the Buffalo Treaty, um, led by Dr. Leroy Little Bear, with, um, with help from, from other many community members all across North America, are helping to bring back the Buffalo by signing the Buffalo Treaty. So this is one of the first international treaties signed between First Nations and Canada and the U.S., bringing together Blackfoot and Cree people in a a spirit of unity, right? Setting aside any old grievances to come together to help to bring back the buffalo. So there's eight articles here that of different ways, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, to bring back the buffalo. And there's a website now, buffalotreaty.com, where you could read more about this. Let's see how I'm bringing back the buffalo. My husband and I, through our nonprofit, we lead um, workshops on buffalo. Um, brain tanning, on scraping buffalo hides, on sharing it with students from kindergarten to university level. This was uh, Michelle Saray, the artist in residency, the middle picture. So we brought this buffalo hide to the university and shared with university students, got them to scrape. But at the time this was taken, I was like, I needed help from my family. So my husband is scraping, my, one of my sons is helping to scrape. On the one on the right is a piece of buffalo rawhide that I painted on this star image and uh, it's based on 
images that I've seen that uh, people have painted on buffalo robes in the past. So it's a miniature one, it's just like four, four inches by four inch. I'm a fashion designer. So I, I, was, um, I was representing Canada, the Global Indigenous Runway in Australia, um, March, 2018. And I made this buffalo dress, my family tree buffalo dress. So I painted this material and at the top of my family tree is buffalo. So I wrote buffalo at the top and made this buffalo headpiece out of organza. And the horns were, were designed with an, an artist, Edward Putra. So I give him credit all the time. He's the one who, who showed me how to design those horns. They're, they're not real horns. They're just um, made out of, of um, uh, different kinds of material. But yeah, so she got to walk down it for, for me. So I'm also bringing back the buffalo, whoops, <laughs> close. In, in storytelling. So here's a picture of me at Prairie Sky School talking to the youth this past year and during COVID, you know, wearing my mask and telling them exact same stories that I'm telling you, but of course in, in a different way. And I was part of a, an, an ex call out for this exhibition called Breathe, where um, these artists, Natalie Shepard, and I um, can't remember the other curator's name, um, they did a call out for people to create masks. They didn't have to be functional, but they had to be artistic. So I made this like this mask out of a buffalo rawhide, and then I painted this buffalo and these crocuses, my version of crocuses. And so maybe I'll just um, end with, uh, and there's of course of me, this is in the Grasslands National Park. I went and I was talking to these women about the 16,000 teepee rings, talking about our ancestors, talking about the energy of the place. And this is where, my ancestors were camp and I was just feeling so good just to be there that um, we seen this, maybe it was a buffalo rubbing stone. And um, I said, I'm gonna get up on top and I just put my arms out. I felt so free and felt strong. And then after they sent me the picture, I said, hey, that looks like a buffalo. No disrespect to the, the buffalo spirit. I, I just, you know, recognized it as, as a buffalo rock after, you know, and, and so I, I just wanted to end with this story that I that I heard um, um, from from the um, uh, it was in a, a wind speaker news, and it was from an elder up north named Maria Linklater. She had said that when baby buffalo are born, where they drop their belly button, a crocus sprouts up. And so now, when I when I see a field of crocuses, and they're the most resilient flower. Um, ever because they grow in the snow still on the ground and um, when I see a field of crocuses I think of baby buffaloes and so part of the work I'm doing on July 1st we we proclaim July as Buffalo History Month, Tatanka History Month, um, Mashkate Bajiki History Month, Pasqua Mustus History Month and um, we're going to be sharing about buffalo history that month of July and so July 1st we're taking it back and calling it Buffalo Day. So I'm working to rename Dudney Avenue, one of the architects of residential school and, um, and, and, and father of, of many nefarious deeds against indigenous people um, to rename Dudney Avenue to Buffalo Avenue or again to Tonka Avenue, whatever the community wants, which, what name they wanna use. I, I like to hear from the community but I'm advocating for that name change because we really need to honor this land, honor these stories, talk about some of these truths and why we are where we are, um, but also acknowledge the hope for the future and also acknowledge that you know we're part of the Buffalo Nation. And that's the only reason why we survived throughout all these different traumas that we're facing, that we faced and that we're still facing to this day. So we need to take that back. And, and use that, those stories, use that energies to help us to, to, to survive, to thrive. That should be our mantra. Let's, let's help each other thrive. We, we need to find ways to, to, um, to move forward together into the future. So yeah, I, I guess I'm, that is my presentation. Panama I, I love this picture of the baby buffalo. I'll be painting these images on, on, on Dudney Avenue on July 1st, along with three other artists. And uh, we're gonna set up some teepees in Buffalo Meadows Park, have a children's powwow and, and help to 
be do our part to help heal the community. So I think I'm pretty close. To, oh, okay, it's 11.29. <laughs> I didn't leave much time for, for Q&A. Um, but um, yeah, I guess I should, oops, <laughs> there's my last screen. Um, but I've just a, a snapshot of, of some of the, the um, research um, that I've done. And um, if anybody, you know, wants a copy of this, of this presentation, I'd be more than willing to share. Panamai, matakiwas, and thank you all for listening.